Hi there, my name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener and forest garden designer based in West Wales. Uh, this is a small video uh, of a slideshow for some clients of mine who are from London and they wanted to know more about the garden design process, or rather my garden design process, and how to choose plants and where to plant them, where to put them, what are the kind of, kind of overlying kind of considerations for it. Um, I'm on Twitter, Forest Garden Wales, Forest, Gar Forest GDN Wales rather, and you can get the, uh, this presentation is online as well, forestgarden.wales forward slash talks forward slash overview. Yeah, it should be down here. And if you want to see the notes, uh, you press P and then you can get the notes up as well. Nothing particularly exciting there, just some more links. Okay, on with the show. Um, there's six different sections. Uh, the principles of forest gardening, everything's useful. And then looking at native, using native plants for wildlife, the aspect of your garden, the orientation of it where the sun is, uh, the soil that you have, and then plant structure, looking at different layers, and how to choose plants with a couple of very useful links for you as well, so that you could feel anyone can really get a start on choosing plants for the right place. So what I will say at the beginning is uh, Creating a Forest Garden by uh, Martin Crawford is a fantastic, fantastic book. If you are interested in forest gardening and want to set one up, it's a, it's a brilliant resource, really, really clear. Gives a very, very good overview of the whole kind of process, rather like this talk, I hope. So, first thing, what we're going to uh, look at is that a garden really ought to be useful to somebody, uh, and that somebody includes wildlife. It's not just about people, it's about everything else that inhabits your garden as well. And this is a principle of forest and wildlife gardening, that you're working with nature and you're kind of providing, you're providing a habitat and food source for nature so that it looks after the garden as a whole. Um, the, you did the kind of list of things, living things, every living thing that you can think of, start with, not humans, but start with the soil biota, the health of the soil, the microbes, the mycorrhizae or fungi, the invertebrates, amphibians, mammals, and then higher life forms like what ourselves are. Uh, and that's who you're designing for. What you choose to grow in your garden uh, is also a food source, something that's edible, a habitat, the protection for other plants, for the wildlife, mulching materials to provide nutrients and so forth. And a key element in this is that you should be looking at stacking functions in permaculture circles. A stacking function is where an element has more than one function. So for example, an autumn olive windbreak will provide fruit, um, shelter, habitat, uh, beautiful flowers, uh, lovely smelling flowers, and it is a nitrogen fixer as well. So native though is generally more useful to everybody than non-native, which I'll move on to. Not necessarily for you humans who have bred plants t for their own purposes. The key principle here about native plants is that they have co-evolved with wildlife, with native uh, fauna. So the native flora has co-evolved with a native fauna, which is why a native plant will generally be a, be a better bet to provide a food source for different stages of life of, of, of wildlife and also a habitat as well. Having said that, there is a fantastic website, database of insects and food plants, and if you, it's pretty complete, I think. I'm not, I'm not uh, very, not that knowledgeable about wildflowers, wild, wild plants, but it's a very good resource to look at the interactions between plants and insects. So you get an idea of how many plants, how, sorry, you will get an idea of how many insects a particular plant will support. And what is brilliant as well is that the RHS have a uh, native filter. If you go to the RHS plant finder, which is listed here, 
you will you can see that there's a, a native filter for native plants uh, so you can if you can choose native if it provides the same benefits for everybody obviously there's certain situations where you want a better crop uh, or you might want a uh, slightly smaller plant and then go for something which is non-native but if you can choose a native plant as well and it's kind of interesting because once you start to get into the sheer range of native plants available not they're not, they're not all that easy to get hold of some of them but they will fill each niche in in, in your garden in your average garden and a fantastic book uh, is a new garden ethic by benjamin um benjamin benjamin Vol i don't know how to pronounce his surname but uh really really i really like his his work uh i i, I think it, it, it's fantastic thinking about wildlife and it's thinking about wildlife in terms of um, climate uh, break, climate emergency and mass extinction, because this is what we are facing and this is what we need to be thinking about. So the aspect, and a lot of people don't really kind of um, don't really think about this, is how how is your garden orientated? <laughs> where does the sun rise? Where does the sun set? So just take some time uh, this is why it's useful to do a plan of your garden whether it's a pencil sketch or a CAD plan or it doesn't really matter but so just draw it and then look where the north part of your garden is and the south part where the sun rises where the sun sets so you get the most of most sun from the south and the light from the west is warmer and generally kind of better than light from the east uh, because the plant has had a time, has had time during the day to warm up, and its stoma, I think it's called the stoma, where the where the, where the gases go in, they can do they can photosynthesize better in the afternoon than they can in the morning. So, afternoon sunlight is more valuable than um, morning sunlight. And then you put your tall plants uh, on the north, so you can have very tall plants, and they're not going to shade. Well, they'll shade your neighbour. <laughs> but they're not going to shade your garden so much. Um, so tall plants in the north, and then kind of short plants down down to the south. And something that a lot of people don't realise as well is that the where the sun rises and where the sun sets changes throughout the year. So as, as you go towards midsummer, the sun, the, the sun actually moves around where it rises and where it sets, and in the winter it narrows. And also the height as well. So in the summer... Um, the, the sun is very high and in the winter the sun is very low will rise and then have a very low um, trajectory so that's worth bearing in mind now a fantastic app which is what you can see in the in the in the screen on the screen here is um, a, an app called sun surveyor and that gives you uh, the position of the where the, where the sun will be not so much a problem if it's a sunny day and you can see the sun, but where the sun rises, how high it goes, and where the sun is. So you can you can estimate the height of a plant that you're putting in, where the sun will be, if it will shade anything else out. And then you can also, which is really cool, you can also change it across the year. So you can see where the sun will be in winter, where the sun will be at the equinox, where the sun will be in, in midsummer. So you get a good idea across the year, but really, really good, really worth it. I think it's paid for, but it's not that much money, but really, really worth it. If you are looking at putting plants in whatever your skill level is just such, such a such a nice bit of kit the next thing to look at is your soil because <laughs> soil is what plants grow in and it sounds really obvious but you just have to know the kind of soil that you have uh, and the base one of the basic the two, the two main things are the acidity of the soil and um, how, how acid it is, it's the pH, and you use a kit to determine this. You can buy a kit um, cheaply from most plant shops or e uh, eBay or Amazon. Um, and some plants uh, don't like to grow in acid soil. Uh, they only like um, alkaline soil and vice versa. Uh, most plants, but you know, have a look at the, when you're looking at the plant that you, that you want to, that you want to, to, to grow, just see what it what its requirements are. Some plants will just grow anywhere, like hawthorn, for example, will grow pretty much anywhere. Um, and the kind of key thing, really, as well, is that the more acid and the more alkaline a soil will get, the less able a plant is 
to absorb nutrients. So it's more a question of um, of scale rather than there being a cut-off point. Acid plant, not acid plant. Um, so yeah, think about that. The other main consideration is soil type. What type of soil that you have? Best way to find this out is to dig a hole and dig different holes around the garden as well. So you're, it's amazing how much the soil can vary whether you've got any rock underneath and you've got sub, you know, different sub substrates, a lump of clay over in, one, in another place, the, the, the soil does change incredibly quickly. And then you can test the, the, the different soil types. You can test um, how much clay they've got in the soil or if it's a sandy soil, loam, silt, chalk. Um, you, there's different tests that you can do. Have a look on the internet. There's a sausage test where you you, you, you get, get a damp piece of soil and rub it, and if it a, forms a sausage, it's clay. If it falls apart, it's sand. Uh, and there's a jar test as well, so where you can break out the sediments in the in, in a jar. So that's 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 worth looking at too. Um, and consider your rainfall, but not just the kind of amount of rain. Uh, it's also where the rain falls in the garden if there's a shadow a rain shadow from a building or from a tree or there's tree roots which are sucking up water that's a major that's a major uh, major consideration for putting a plant in a particular place if it will have enough um, if it will have enough moisture and then on to the actual design this is a little sketch that I did for for my clients in, in North London just to give them an idea of the different the different size trees and the different the size of the trees and the bushes but the basic structure of the garden uh, is its orientation and what the existing buildings are and the kind of existing structures and sh sheds and fences and yeah, the like. And then when you introduce plants into it, uh, think of the plants in layers. Now forest gardening is very efficient in its use of, uh, of space because there's there's seven layers in total but you can think of it basically as three layers you have the canopy layer which is your trees your your your, 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 big, your big trees then you have a shrub kind of small tree layer and then you have the kind of ground cover herbaceous perennials and ground cover uh, a bit lower down and if you think of it in those three kind of levels then when you're thinking about where to put a plant you are thinking about the space that, the, that they occupy on that level and then how much light is being let through. And then think of the plants as shapes. So on, on the actual, on, on the plan that, I'm, that I've uh, done, you can see there's a dark green, uh, there's a dark green Irish yew and that's a very um, upright plant, upright kind of small tree. And uh, that doesn't cast that much shadow. It's very thick, but doesn't cast much shadow. Whereas next to it is a fig, which is kind of pretty dense with big leaves. So think of the plants that you're, that you're planting, um, what shape they are and how much space they will take up. And then a critical consideration, this really is at the, the basis of the reason why you make a plan is, so that you, it, it is for the spacing. So when you're, when you're thinking about the plant, you're thinking about how much space that plant occupies, how much space it takes up. Um, you don't. You, when you plant the plant, you want it to. You want it to grow to its final size, its height, and its width. If you if you put a big plant in a small space, you will spend the rest of your life pruning it and cutting it back, and it's just a constant struggle. Better to put the the right size plant in the in, in its place, in its in the right space for it. And kind of the corollary to that is that the more the better spacing you have, you allow more light to come in for other plants as well. If everything's kind of crammed up, there'll be very little light coming down below. So make sure there's enough space between plants. Don't be tempted just to put like one kind of stick thin plant, stick thin plant in, and then think, oh, it's not. That's not. I put more plants in. Make sure, allow for it to grow. Okay. And then on the plan that I created, the CAD plan. Again, this can just be. This doesn't matter if it's pencil and paper. It gets you an idea of where the plants are and how how much space they're taking up. Now, what you can actually see is there's a there's a big uh, Italian alder, um, which takes up a lot of space, has a six meter diameter, but that Italian alder would have its c uh, crown uh, canopy raised. So you cut the lower branches off which then allows more light to come in. And it's also a very vertical tree as well, and very kind of well behaved. It's not like some trees 
or like some some willows for example will just go off in all directions an Italian order is very upright um, so yeah that's the kind of critical thing for a, a for a forest garden in particular but also any other garden it's a, it's a spacing that the plant that the plants take up uh, and then choosing plants now there are two really fantastic websites to, to, to choose plants now from a forest garden perspective there's a there's a website called plants for a future they they there's a link and there's a link there plants for a future lists kind of useful plants in all, all manner shape and sizes and it's a fantastic resource and what they have for each each plant they'll have the height and the diameter of the plant as well uh, as well and it will also tell you what the, the growing conditions should be for that plant what they will tolerate and what they like too another great resource which I've only just start, recently started using to any any degree is RHS plant finder and the brilliant thing about that is that they have a checkbox which I showed you earlier on for native plants so you can look for a plant and then see if there are any native species of that plant so uh, I looked up cornus the other day somebody mentioned that cornus um, oh, goodness me what's it, uh, cornelian cherry cornus cornus mass I think it is somebody said oh that's a, a, that's a, 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 a British native and I said yeah that doesn't sound right but I looked it up on the on the RHS website it's not it's it, it's it's a naturalized plant it's not a native but I could tell very quickly to see if it was just by looking on the RHS plant finder and again they'll give you the ultimate height and the width of the plant which is uh, I always kind of recommend that you grow you grow <laughs> within those boundaries um, and another thing worth mentioning here this is this, this goes out to Matt uh, is the rootstock there's a link there to a uh, my website where there's a, an article explaining the rootstock so for, for, for well cultivated plants you can buy rootstock so for apples and for um, amelanchias actually as well apples pears damsons you'll get a rootstock and a rootstock it, it, it determines the, the the vigor and the ultimate height and the and diameter of the tree so choosing the rootstock will determine the ultimate height and, and width of the tree um, so uh, 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 you can choose one which will fit your space and what you're doing as well when you're choosing plants you've got to consider all these factors in in tandem I don't know if tandem is the right word but you've got to consider all these factors together so that you have the light the soil the water other plants it all combines so it's never you know it's, it's a balancing act trying to choose the plant for the, for the place and have fun experiment and try and find out and what it comes down to is a bit hackneyed but what it does come down to is choosing the right plant for the right place so that you have a happy healthy plant then you know it's in the right place okay might <laughs> make sure it doesn't grow too big but if it's happy and it's healthy then you'd know you've, you you know you've made the right choice for it uh, and then finally just to kind of wrap up here's a, th there's a list here on the for Martin Crawford's uh, books and courses uh, Benjamin's book uh, the database of insects and plants and food plants plants for a future an RHS plant finder and also uh, uh, an additional link to Orange Pippin who do a whole fantastic range of different fruit trees um, I hope that was useful and um, shall I whiz back to the beginning uh, I hope that was useful do leave any comments on crikey I should put this on YouTube as well leave any comments on YouTube and do tweet me if you have any questions this is very rough and ready but any, any feedback is, is is really welcome and I will probably be uh, almost definitely be updating this uh, this uh, the slideshow as well okay thank you for your time